Okay, so let's begin our discussion of nuclear chemistry. And this is the last unit normally taught by chemistry teachers because this is the unit where it really isn't chemistry. Yes, we're talking about atoms. Yes, we're talking about some electrons and protons. But really, that's where it starts for chemistry. Chemistry, if I sum it up in one word, is about the electrons. Nuclear chemistry is about the changes in the nucleus, which actually opens up the concepts of where matter began, the Big Bang. Okay, so really this is about physics. Okay, and however, uh, many uh, physics, high school physics courses don't actually cover this anymore. New York State, it's not really part of the, uh, the, the, the physics regents anymore. So it's really up to us chemists to talk about nuclear physics, which again, uh, isn't really chemistry. So I, I say that because when you take the New York State Regents or any other chemistry class that mixes in nuclear chemistry, it is so far different than regular chemistry. Because again, chemistry really is about the attractive forces for electrons. Nuclear chemistry isn't about that. It's about the changes of the nucleus and its origins and where it may have begun. So this opens up physics. Okay, really this is nuclear physics. All right, but we're going to talk about it. And so when we do questions based on nuclear chemistry, to understand that what we're talking about is unlike everything else we've done all year. And for that reason, most, okay, not all, but most chemistry teachers who have to teach, or this is part of their class, okay, um, do it last to show that contrast. And what's the contrast? Well, we're going to see that when we see nuclear equations, not chemical reactions. And we'll just get right to it. So let's begin our discussion of nuclear chemistry or physics, okay, by talking about where did it start and where it came from. Okay, well, really, I can't talk about uh, where we're going here without talking about William Rochin, who was the discoverer of the x-rays, and that's his wife's ring, and that's one of the first images that he was obtained. And, of course, they called them x-rays because they didn't know where these rays were coming from, but they did know they went through soft tissue, and he was able to photograph plates and get an image of where the rays could not go through as well. And so this actually is his wife's wedding ring. That's a nice ring, I guess. Uh, any case, really cool about this uh, man right here is that he wasn't interested in making money. He didn't patent his x-ray machine, which was based upon the Crooks tube in a second. He actually unpatented it and made sure that everyone had the ability to uh, utilize this technology for medicine. So uh, pretty cool there. And so we know that the x-ray came from the Crooks tube, right? The end of the Crooks tube. And we should know this is a cathode ray tube and the older TVs were CRTs and they showed off x-rays. That's why people said, hey, um, don't sit next to TVs so close. I remember my mom saying that and she was right. Obviously, later on, they put big, big lead kind of glass in front to eliminate that. But earlier TVs did give off x-rays, uh, certainly lower amounts. But any case, this Crooks tube was initially used by J.J. Thompson to discover there were electrical particles being pulled from atoms, right? So this part right here was the cathode, right? The cathode. And the cathode region, okay, uh, was connected, all right? It was, of course, uh, negatively charged, these plates. And they were negatively charged because they were attached to the anode of a battery. Okay, and this was connected to the cathode of the battery. This is the electrolytic cell. So this was the anode, okay, of the electrolytic cell. I should say at least these plates right here. Okay, and so the cathode is positive in a voltaic cell, so the anode here is positive here. And if you remember, okay, we have an atom, and of course what's happening is an atom is made of positives and negatives, and the negatives, the electrons, were ripped away from the atom as they went toward the positive plate, okay? I should finish that off there, all right? And we also know there was uh, something called canal rays that went backwards, but these particles were, of course, what J.J. Thompson discovered to be as electrons. But, okay, we do know that these high-energy electrons, okay, could slam into the metals. And when they slam into the metals, they could excite electrons that are in lower energy levels 
to very, very high energy levels. And of course, electrons go jump back, relieve that stress, and they gave off X-rays is one of the reasons, okay, X-rays were given off, all right? And so that's something, um, any case, that we're talking about here, and it's something that connects to the course here. So these X-rays were uh, called X-rays because they didn't know, and, 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 and uh, this man right here that we talked about, all right, William Rochin, okay, used these X-rays as a tool for science. All right, so... Uh, getting rid of the drawing tool, okay, and that's what he did. Any case, moving forward, all right, and of course, uh, X rays became almost uh, an international celebrity, or at least Wilhelm became an international celebrity. Barely two months after this discovery, he received an honorable decoration from the Kaiser, okay, I believe he was. Austrian. And in 1901, he won the first ever Nobel Prize in physics. Okay. In some places, X-rays are called Rochin rays after him. But this became such a cool little thing. They didn't know the uh, danger of X-rays. This was high energy electromagnetic radiation, which by the way is a mutagen, right? It's going to actually uh, break apart DNA, uh, cause mutations that could be lethal, right? So that's why they cover your gametes, okay? Uh, when or at least your gonads, I should say, your sexual organs, okay, when you take an x-ray. But they didn't know the dangers of these things. So this is a coin-operated x-ray machine in 1900. They just had out in the open that people could, hey, hey, let's take a x-ray of your hand or something, all right? And gosh, boy, that's kind of crazy without understanding the uh, negative effects of it. Any case, moving forward, we're going to go on to radioactivity. Now, radioactivity, I can't really talk about unless I talk about some major players, okay? Now, uh, the, the three major players beyond Wilhelm Rochin was Henry Becquerel, Pierre Curie, and Madame Curie. Now, all of these, all three of these won the Nobel Prize in 1903 for their work in recognizing that they together, okay, helped understand that radiation was a phenomenon, that there was something called radiation or energy emitted from certain atoms, okay? And it was discovered first by Henry Becquerel, and it was the Marie Curie and Pierre Curie, that a wife and husband team, and I say wife first because she was really the leader in that charge of discovering what radioactivity was and what elements and uh, were responsible, okay? Now, I can't say they knew exactly what it was, but they were understanding the phenomenon and using it to um, to figure what elements had it. So it was major, major work done by all three, and I'll talk about them. But it didn't start until Henry Becquerel, uh, thinking about x-rays that Wilhelm Rochin himself were using that started the process. So Henry Becquerel, okay, let's talk about him. Um, and of course, he was a classical physicist himself, but more importantly, he was interested in something called phosphorescence, and phosphorescence is nothing more than something that will glow when you put energy in it. We had a, a, a phosphorescent slime that we made, or cross-linked polymer, and we put the the, um, we had a glow in a dark, and we put, put it in light, and it glows for a certain amount of time, it's, it, but it doesn't do that unless you give it some initial energy, so he was investigating some some uh, compounds. In fact, the compounds he had from his dad, who was also, and his grandfather, who were both um, well-known physicists of the day, um, he had something called uranium salts, which means they had a bunch of different compounds. Of course, there's uranium in there. And he noticed that when you put light on them or sunlight, they glowed for a amount of time. So you want to know what that was. All right. So again, using some uranium salts and trying to understand maybe the sun or the light that made the uranium salts glow was due to some kind of X-ray light radiation from that. So he's trying to tie in the X-ray emitted by the Crookes tube that was a natural occurring effect from possibly the sun that made compounds glow. All right, and that's what he was doing. And um, so his famous, um, or his famous um, uh, work here was that um, he one day uh, was using this experiments with uh, um, salts of uranium, compounds of uranium, 
not knowing uranium itself is radioactive. That was obviously something that was found by the threesome there. But the point was, he was doing experiments, and so, as the story goes, there was a cloudy day, or it was a cloudy storm that came by, and that uh, he couldn't do the experiments with the sun anymore. So he put his uranium salts in a draw, and supposedly, uh, there was three draws. In the top draw, he put the uranium salts. In the middle draw, he had some keys. And in the third draw, he put the um, the photographic plates. Okay, that's where the images are occurring. And so after three days of just stormy weather or no sun, for whatever reason, he decided to um, have the plates, um, um, uh, you know, chemically uh, and analyzed, and I say chemically analyzed, but we now say develop. You guys, the kids now don't know what develop filming is, but we, before we had digital uh, cameras, we had film, and we, we, we processed that. So in any case, he processed the film, and he got images. Now, this I don't think is the exact image, but supposedly he got images of keys. Now, what this is right here is called the Maltese cross, okay? But he was able to see that the light from the sun had nothing to do with these rays or this type of emission that was causing the photographic plates to uh, have an image on it. So this is a some sort of Maltese cross, but suppose it was keys. All right. So he was able to say, and he was the first to discover something called Becquerel rays. Were they X-rays? He didn't think so because he wasn't using a Crookes II. There was some kind of release of energy that was due to the at or ah, the compounds itself. We can't say atoms yet, right? And it's important to realize that we're talking about a time period where people were discovering atoms. Remember, look at the time period. Okay, the time period is turn of the century, 1900s, 1800s. It wasn't until 1905 that all scientists agreed that atoms existed. So we have this phenomenon of compounds giving off energy, this, this phenomenon of, of radiation, and the development of the atom theory, particle theory at the same time. So these things were happening. We did talk about that. We left this alone, so we're going back. Now, Pierre Curie um, was a physicist in his own right that was uh, very uh, important in this process and before he um, worked on radioactivity with his wife who really made the charge that way he did a lot of work with crystals and saw a piezoelectric quartz electrometer basically was able to do he was to measure the fact that if you take uh, certain types of crystals like quarks and you you compress them they give off a voltage and decompress them likewise. And he was able to create these circuits or these crystal oscillators that we still use for watches or digital electronic circuits still rely on his form of crystal oscillators. Now, you hear the quartz watches, that's where it comes from, but also think about our scales in our lab. Our electrical scales use a piezoelectric crystal, okay? Uh, so a lot of work, and I'm again, I'm, I'm not doing these guys justice by talking about them, but he was able to come up with an electrometer that could measure small changes of electrical input that was really, really, really important in measuring, measuring radioactivity. So it's his work that set the stage. And of course, he shared a Nobel Prize in 1903 with his wife and with Henry Becquerel, and again, um, defining or at least coming to the conclusion that compounds give off certain type of energy naturally, okay? And that's new. Remember, the x-ray was because you turn on the electrode and you uh, made x-rays. This is talking about a scenario where atoms by themselves are giving off x-ray x-ray like uh, radiation on their own without turning something on. That was unique, and they discovered that. Okay, and the Curies went a little farther. They were able to actually um, find what atoms were doing it, and they were able to purify atoms based upon their differences and how they had differences in their type of radioactivity. Again, not doing them the, the justice, okay, in this quick representation, but you should be aware of these individuals. Now, Madame Curie, again, probably the most important person of the three, even though Becquerel was the first to say, hey, there's something here that doesn't require energy. She led the charge and drove her husband to do his research in this area. So her her achievements are so vast, okay? She, she actually coined the word radioactivity and the techniques for isolating radioactive isotopes. Isotopes, you remember, are forms of elements. And he discovered two elements, polonium, she named it after her um, her country, she came from Poland, and radium, okay, because it, it basically glows, 
And she discovered two ohms based upon their little slight differences in their radioactivity that they measured with Pierre's electrometer, kind of the first Geiger counter kind of thing. So under her direction, the world's first studies are conducted into the treatment of neoplasms using radioactive isotopes. She was the first to take this and apply it to medicine, which we now know there's radio uh, isotopic medicine that's all over the place now in, in, in diagnostic and in treatment of certain diseases. She, uh, the Curie is actually a unit of radioactivity now. She founded Curie Institutes in Paris and Warsaw, which remain centers of medical research today. During World War II, she developed mobile radiographic units to provide x-ray surfaces to field hospitals, and the list goes on. But what's really cool is for my lady or female ch chemistry or science people out here, she was the first person to win first woman to win a Nobel Prize, okay? Well, the Nobel Prize wasn't given out until 1901, so she's like the fourth person ever to win it, but who cares? Um, she's the first person to win a Nobel Prize, the first person, and the only women, only, she's the first person in the, uh, that win two Nobel Prizes, okay? So obviously she's the only woman to win a Nobel Prize, and she's the only person to win a Nobel Prize in two different scientific fields, so pretty amazing, all right? Uh, and of course, the Curie family has five Nobel Prizes. I think it includes her daughter as well. All right, so in any case, uh, many accomplishments here, but she was the driving factor with Pierre. If it wasn't for Madame Curie, they would not have won uh, the first Nobel Prize in terms of radiation. In fact, this, as the story goes, they wanted to give the Nobel Prize in 2003 to Henry Becquerel and just Pierre because women weren't accepted yet. And um, uh, Pierre was outraged over that and showed her work and showed that she was a driving force and, and because of the research and how documented she was about what she did it was it was easy to say yeah she she deserves it in fact maybe she should earn it by herself as some people also argued okay so any case um going on here we have Ernest Rutherford bringing him back. Remember Ernest Rutherford? Okay, um, he was won a Nobel Prize in 1908 for basically discovering the first types of radiation that we're going to talk about here, alpha and beta. Okay, alpha for the first type, beta for the second type. Okay, of course, that's A and B in the Greek alphabet. We all know that he proved that alpha radiation are helium nuclei. Uh, remember, he performed his most famous work, although he didn't do the experiment. Remember, we talked about Ernest Martzen and Geiger with their famous um, gold foil experiment. Uh, Ernest, Ernest, okay. He performed his first artificially induced nuclear reaction where he had nitrogen nuclei were bombarded with alpha particles. He was the first to do a nuclear reaction. This is not chemical as I'm talking about. Nuclear reactions have nothing to do with electrons. They're dealing with changes of the nucleus. He was the first to synthetically change an atom. Remember, okay, chemistry started with the warlords and wizards back in the medieval time. Sorry for those people that believe that there were Merlins, and maybe they were. We have no scientific proof, but we think that the people knew some chemistry experiments and could do things. Any case, there were many of them supposedly they were trying to change things into gold. They were trying to change, how, well, why does one thing become gold and one's not? Well, if you remember, gold has 79 protons. What makes an atom unique, remember by Henry Mosley, which, by the way, my friend, is a student of Ernest Rutherford, suggested there were 79 protons in gold, and no other atom has that. Well, my friend, Ernest Rutherford was the first to start changing atoms by changing their proton number. Okay, obviously there's a heck of a lot more nuclear reactions since then. All right, he also discovered the hydrogen atom, okay, um, which later became known as the proton, although it was Henry Mosley who was quantitative in showing that every single atom has a unique number. Don't forget, Chadwick was a student of Rutherford, okay, that discovered the neutron. So this guy is called the father of the atomic structure. He actually had his first model of the atom where the nucleus was small and had positive force because of the protons and electrons were on the outside. Remember, it was who? Bohr who organized the electrons and energy levels after and started the quantum revolution. So let's continue on. All right. So now we're getting to the meat of this. And I needed to do that. I'm sorry to go back through the history. But now we need to talk about isotopes again. Isotopes, and this is back, is the same element. Now, why are they the same element? Well, they have what? They have the same number of what? The same number of protons, right? There's one proton, one proton, one proton. Hydrogen is hydrogen because of one proton. Now notice what makes these different, very famous 
isotopes, they call it deuterium, hydrogen two. Now, why is it two? Because the mass is two. We later found out that a proton, oops, and a neutron have about the same mass. So the mass of the atom is due to the nucleus, right? The electrons have an insignificant mass. Remember, electron is about, what, 2,000 times lighter, okay, than that of a single proton, single neutron. So the mass of the atom, that's what this is right here, is that. So what we have here is the same atom, same hydrogen, I'm sorry, I should say the same element, but different number of neutrons. And having different neutrons gives them a different mass. So we, uh, we say hydrogen one saying, hey, that's the hydrogen with one proton only. Hydrogen two means, hey, it's a mass of two because we have one neutron. And of course, hydrogen three is one proton and two neutrons. So this is, these are talking about specific isotopes. Nobody ever says hydrogen, okay? Normally when we're talking about atoms or uh, nuclear chemistry or physics, because you wanna talk about exactly which atom or form of the element you have. And the form is called an isotope. Same number of what? Protons, different number of neutrons. And we learned about this by what? By the mass spectrometer. We can remember the mass spectrometer where we split up atoms based upon their different masses. Okay. Any case, abundance in nature. Okay. Uh, but most of hydrogen is hydrogen one. And this is a one here once that cle clears. Okay. And this is hydrogen two. Remember the ones are on the bottom. And this is hydrogen three. And of course, tritium, deuterium, and hydrogen are the names of the individual uh, isotopes. Now, why do I bring these up? Well, because when we talk about radioactivity that the Madame Curie's coined, we're talking about party people, the fact that usually one of the isotopes of some elements, okay, has a problem. And that problem is that the nucleus is unstable. And unstable means high energy. It wants to do something with it. So in this case, this is an example of a radioisotope. This is an isotope that is unstable because something is wrong in that nucleus. Okay, and so we're, we're understanding that radioactivity is that there's something wrong in the nucleus. When it was made, okay, or when it accepted more neutrons, and it can, okay, we know that um, hydrogen atoms can absorb neutrons and they use them in water, okay, as moderators to slow down nuclear reactions in. Um, uh, electrical nuclear reactors that we have in our um, in our society that produce electricity and those are fission reactions and we use a moderator to collect that we'll talk more about that but the point is okay this is unstable because there's a problem the problem here we're going to talk about is too many neutrons so this radioisotope okay or this form of hydrogen is going to emit energy to get stable and what does it do it changes itself so we'll talk more about that okay now here's another example Okay, we have carbon-12 and carbon-14, and this is kind of like my Rutherford um, model of the atom where you have the protons and neutrons. Remember, carbon is carbon-6. I'm sorry, it has six protons. Only carbon has six, so you can count the six protons. Now, carbon-12 would mean it has six protons and six neutrons because the mass of the atom is the addition of all the protons and neutrons since protons and neutrons have the same mass. Now, this is carbon-14. Whoa, it's two more. Electrons are still the same because the positives equal the atom, uh, equal the the positive six equals a negative six of the six electrons. Don't forget that isotopes are still atoms. And when I say atom, you say neutral. So the protons equal electrons here. So it's a little bit of review here, okay, of atomic structure. So same thing here, proton six equals six electrons. Nothing's different. The difference here in these two isotopes is that carbon-14 has two more units, atomic mass units, okay, sometimes called AU or AMU, okay, and has two more neutrons. This has what? 14 minus 6 is how you actually get the neutrons, is what? Is uh, uh, 8 neutrons, this has uh, 12. 12 minus 6, and all I'm doing is taking the mass and subtracting it, subtracting the value of the atomic number, and that gives us that. So, what do we have here? Okay, well, this is important. Carbon-12, that's the stable form, exists 99% of the time. It has 12 AMU. And what I'm showing you is a weighted mass problem. And then we're going to find exactly why it has a certain number. Uh, carbon-14, this is the radioactive form. This is the radioisotope. And you'll say, well, why is the radioisotope? Well, for the same reason hydrogen-3 has. It has too many neutrons, which we're going to find is the first reason why nuclei are high energy and there's something wrong with them and they want to fix them. So they do something. They emit radiation to fix their nucleus. Okay. But this is only a small percent. And so when you do the, when you take the actual atomic masses, okay, this being 
a little more heavier because of two more neutrons. Okay, and that's why these are isotopes, differ by the neutrons, and you multiply them by their percentages, you get these numbers we add together, and that's why carbon-12 on the periodic table, okay, is listed as a fraction, something else we should know, all right, as we go through this. And, and this is a classic regents level type of calculation they expect you to do. Okay, we've covered that. So in any case, moving on. So this carbon-14 acting as a radioisotope, meaning it's going to fix itself, undergoes a nuclear equation. It is not chemistry. It's not about electrons. We're not breaking bonds and forming new bonds. What we're doing is that carbon-14 by itself, and this is carbon dating, right? So a small percent of carbon over time becomes nitrogen. What? Carbon becomes nitrogen. Now we sound like the what? The, world, the warlords or the wizards or the merlins. We're changing carbon into nitrogen. How can that happen? Well, we emit something called a beta particle. Now, let's remember, the top number here is the mass number, and we give a zero for things that have insignificant mass, okay? And this bottom number is the charge number. So, by the way, this is an electron. Now, we know electrons do have some mass, but their math mass is so small compared to a proton or a neutron, we say it's insignificant, and you'll see a zero there, okay? So, this is actually an electron that what? comes out of the nucleus to make this thing stable, okay? And this is an example of a nuclear reaction. Even though you say, Mr. Grazzi, there's no electrons, you got an electron here. We're talking about an electron that came out of the nucleus, huh? And let's talk about this. Six protons, seven protons, okay? And notice something, all right? 14 over six, 14 over seven, and something else to notice, Okay, that's really the 14 over 7 is not important yet, but 7 plus a negative 1 is 6 on this side. There's 6 on this side. 14 plus 0 is 14 on this side, 14 on this side. So there's mass and charge conservation we'll talk about. I'm going to explain this, so just give me a second. All right, so the, the point I'm trying to make here is that the radioactive carbon, carbon-14, becomes the more stable nitrogen when it emits a high-speed electron, which, by the way, is also a mutagen. You don't want to be around this. And we also know something about electrons is those electrons could be considered X-rays too, right? But if they go fast enough. But these are high-energy electrons that come out of the nucleus, and we make a more stable compound. All right, let's continue on. And so we talk about stable and unstable nuclei. That's what's happening here. We have a radioactive isotope. We have a form of an atom with something is wrong with its nucleus. And it emits a radioactive radiation, okay, and becomes more stable or stabler isotope as a process. And so it gives off the energy, okay, as radiation to get more stable. And it's a spontaneous process because, hey, we go from high to low. It's kind of an exothermic reaction. We know exothermic reactions are very favorable, okay, in the second law of thermodynamics. We know things have to get more what? Um, entropy has to increase in order to become stable. But obviously, releasing the energy and becoming more stable, entropy of the universe increases. Now, we really know what this means. It means an unstable nucleus becomes more, becomes a more stable nucleus in the process through this. Okay, so that's what you're thinking about. Anytime you're thinking about radiation, we're talking about, think about the nucleus is unstable and becoming more stable, all right? And here's the first form. Now, there are four basic reasons why an atom's nucleus is unstable. The first is there's too many neutrons in the nucleus. Too many neutrons. We saw that with hydrogen-3. We saw that with carbon-14. Carbon-14, by the way, we can carbon date because over time, you're going to have less of it. Okay? So that's the first one. And so too many neutrons in the nucleus. Okay, let's look at a chart here. A neutron the proton ratio is often discussed apart in low-level um, uh, chemistry, okay, even though I feel like this is physics, um, curriculums. So here's the number of neutrons and protons. And so when you have atoms 0 through 20, what we have here is the neutrons and protons usually are the same. The ones that deviate, if you look at this little dot right here, the ones that deviate have too many neutrons over this stability zone okay, have a problem. And that problem is they have too many neutrons. Now, we don't know why, but having too many neutrons destabilizes a nucleus, okay? So, and of course, you notice as the number of protons increases, that stability zone kind of goes up. It's not a one-to-one -one ratio. So that one-to-one -one ratio is about from zero to 20 elements, and then it kind of goes up. And the reason for that is the proton number 
also destabilizes that. But the bottom line is the stability zone, the proton and neutron ratio is a factor. So if you have too many proton, too many neutrons compared to protons, it makes the nucleus unstable. So hydrogen three, tritium, or carbon 14 were unstable. They had too many neutrons. So you can guess what they were gonna do. They were gonna try to lower that ratio. So the first type of decay is called beta decay. And so sometimes called B negative. And what happens is we lower the neutron ratio. And so how does that happen? Because you might say, well, how does an electron get emitted from the nucleus? So here's how it happens. A neutron, remember you have too many neutrons if you undergo beta decay, it's, you destabilize a nucleus, too many neutrons. So a neutron in the nucleus, remember this is nuclear chemistry, splits into a proton and an electron. Ah, neutrons are neutral, don't have a charge, because why? They are made of a positive and a negative. Now, in truth, we know neutrons are made of quarks. So it's the quark ratio that splits. And this is oversimplified. There's actually a neutrino that's given off. But the bottom line, simplistically, a neutron splits into a proton. That lowers the what? Neutron value, increases the proton value, and then a high-speed electron is emitted from the process. So a neutron is going to be a little bit more heavier than a proton because it includes, I guess, the electron part and a neutrino. Neutrinos are, okay, neutral charged particles that have small amount of mass too. All right. So here's an example of beta decay. Bring back carbon-14. Okay. So it's got six protons. Okay. And what happens? Okay. Well, too many neutrons destabilize the nucleus. We don't know quite why, but too many neutrons do. And so we know that having too many neutrons, uh, what's going to happen is a neutron becomes a proton. Hey, there! this one became a proton and emits high-speed electron. And there is the nuclear, the nuclear equation. Remember, even though I have an electron here, it's showing how the uh, what the nucleus of carbon 14 changes so because the proton number increases a neutron becomes a proton this becomes nitrogen only nitrogen has atomic number seven now this top number stays the same because a proton and a neutron have about the same what same uh a value of mass okay so what do we do we emitted an electron from the nucleus by a proton becoming a neutron, sending out the negative form of it, okay, outward. And look, 14 divided by 7 is 7. This is a one-to-one -one ratio of protons to neutrons. How many neutrons here? 14 minus 6, 8 neutrons is 6. This has too many neutrons. This has the what? That equal value that we saw. A one to one. So unstable nucleus emits a high speed particle, beta decay. And we call this decay because this undergoes, okay, something called nuclear um, transmutation. Uh, transmutation means that this atom becomes a brand new atom because of the proton number. It transmutates naturally, okay, nothing is making it happen into nitrogen and electron is given off. All right, so moving on. So here we go, it's beta decay, and a neutron becomes a proton. B negative is the electron, and this is that neutrino, okay, that's there. But we don't consider that, and, and, and people don't talk about that in very simple, low-level courses. But it's there for those that want to yell at me if I don't mention it. Okay, uh, any case. So what do we have here? We have carbon-14, 8 a neutron, 6 protons, it's a 1.33 ratio. After it transmutates, okay, naturally... It has a one-to-one -one ratio. So the reason it gives off a beta particle is to get stable and fix its nucleus and have that one-to-one -one ratio. Okay, so here's a classic Regents chemistry question here. We have strontium, okay, 38's below here, 38 here, and 90 here. It gives off a beta particle. Beta particles will be given to you in table O. What is X? Okay, and of course, um, what is X? Well, X is Y. And that was poorly done by my part. But what is this value? Well, if you notice, how do I do this? This is a 38. This is 39 plus a negative 1. So to get this number, this has to be 39. Electrons don't have a mass, so 90 plus 0 is 0. So again, if this is strontium 90, 38 is here. This side has to equal 38. So if I didn't give you this value here, you'd have to know it's 39 because 39 plus a negative 1 is a 38. Remember, the 38's there. Okay, so what is X? 
It is why yttrium is atomic number 39. I don't know why that didn't work. That that should have been something I did. And maybe I maybe I hit it. Oh, yeah. What is X? And then if you do this, it's Y because that's yttrium and only yttrium. OK, element with the symbol Y is 39. I was trying to be funny and it didn't work out. That's often the case, I think. OK, we already talked about too many neutrons. What about too few neutrons? Right. If we go back to that chart, which I'm not going to go to, we have some that are under that one to one ratio or under that stability zone. We call this positron decay or beta decay. Now, positron decay is where a proton in the nucleus splits into the neutron, right, and gives off an electron with positive charge. What? An electron with positive charge is called a positron. And my friends, this is an example of antimatter. OK, and so antimatter has been around in discussion since the 30s, since quantum mechanics. People used to take out their negative uh, solution and say, ah, we can't use a negative solution because how can we talk about negative solutions? But the point is that the mathematics proved that there was something called electrons with positive charges and they're called antimatter. In fact, part of the Big Bang theory, if I'm not mistaken, is that all matter created from the Big Bang. The Big Bang is where the universe began with a small little bit of energy or a, a huge amount of energy in a small area was converted into all the matter in an explosion. So energy became matter. It's what Einstein's famous equation, E equals mc squared. Um, and during that process, supposedly half the matter was regular matter, half was antimatter. We don't know why and where that antimatter is gone, but we are slowly discovering it. And one type of antimatter is the antimatter of an electron. Electrons are usually zero E negative one. This one is zero plus one. And what we know about antimatter, or at least the, the, um, um, the mathematics point out, is that during the Big Bang, small amount of energy became matter. Well, you should be able to go backwards. The matter can go back to energy. So what we know from mathematics, and we've seen this now, is that the anti-electron particle called a proton, when it finds an electron, they annihilate themselves. All the mass gets converted to energy, okay? And we've, sat, we've found so far a positron. We found the anti-particle for a proton, all right? And we also found the anti-matter uh, nucleus of helium okay which is two protons all right uh any case so we found some and it's important to realize that we use this um actually in a form of a form of um, diagnostic tool people are shot with radioisotopes with low half-life so they get out of their body fast they decay fast but things that give off positron decay actually will find electrons and when they hit the electrons okay they make uh, a flash of electromagnetic radiation, which helps you actually uh, make an image of this soft tissue that you're trying to see. Uh, in fact, they call this positron emission topography. It's called a PET scan. Maybe you unfortunately had one or heard of it. And it's the best way we can actually look at the brain through a PET scan. So you actually get shot with a radioactive isotope that emits a positron because the nuclei has under the amount of what? neutrons it's supposed to have and when that collides with an electron which are all over the place okay we can use those flashes electromagnetic energy to actually map a three-dimensional image of the brain it's the best image of the brain that we get from pet scans any case look at carbon we know it's carbon 12 here's another isotope of carbon carbon 10 what it's normally 12 but it's under this is under so therefore it gives off a what a proton splits into a neutron and that antimatter here of an electron and, and 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 you can if you didn't have this here you can figure this out this is not a chemical it's a nuclear equation plus one and a five is six what 10 plus zero is 10 so you can see how you can do that and b positive is another way to do that now what's happening here carbon is four six it's neutron to proton ratios under that one remember zero to 20 it should be a one to one so what's wrong with this this carbon 10 has the wrong number of neutrons, two less neutrons. To fix it, a proton becomes a neutron. And so we lower the proton number. That's why it trans uh, mutates into boron, okay? And it becomes a beta plus particle. But notice something, 
10 over 5 is 1 to 1. So carbon 10 fixes itself by emitting a positron. Okay, pretty cool. All right, and here's an example of an electron and a positron coming together, which is the opposite of the Big Bang, and creating the energy. And they create little bouts of gamma rays. Okay, so go over beta decay. What are we doing? We're fixing the nucleus, okay, that had a greater than uh, one to one ratio by emitting a what? By emitting an electron from the nucleus that comes from a neutron splitting into a positive proton and a negative, and this is emitted. So a neutron becomes a proton, so we lower that ratio. In beta plus decay or positron decay, we emit the positive form because a proton becomes a neutron. And it loses its positive charge to a little bit of mass of that positive antimatter um, electron. And you go from a lower than one to one to one. So these are the two ways that the atoms be help themselves, fix themselves, by emitting this particle of high energy called radiation. Okay? Now, beta decay was the second form of radiation that Rutherford was able to uh, find. Uh, he did not discover positron. We'll, go into, we'll get into the other one soon enough. Okay, so we did beta decay, positron, too many, too few, and now we have too many protons in the nucleus. Okay, and that's alpha decay. And what do we know about that? Well, this is really important. Okay, for whatever reason, every single element beyond atomic number 83 is radioactive. That means every single isotope. There are no stable isotopes of all these elements beyond atomic number 83. Now, there are other, okay, elements that have radioactive forms, okay, like we talked about hydrogen has hydrogen 3 is radioactive, too many what, protons, uh, carbon 12 is, but these forms, these guys, every form of these are radioactive, and why? They have too many protons. So the third type is overcrowding the nucleus. Now, when you have too many positives in a small place, eventually that binding energy that keeps the nucleus together can't keep all those positives in a small place together, and they want to lose positives. So alpha decay fixes the too many protons. You should be aware, okay, of the following. All elements with greater than 83 protons are unstable. That means, okay, there are no stable isotopes. And, and you should know that all of these guys have to undergo something called alpha decay to fix that problem. Beta decay won't fix that problem. Positron decay won't fix that problem because it's not about the neutrons. It's about too many protons. Okay, so an overcrowded nucleus leads to a loss of protons. So these guys are getting off an alpha particle, which we'll find out is a helium nucleus. And let's go into that. So an alpha decay, and here's an example of uranium. Okay, it's beyond atomic number 83. And notice something, it gives off, now you see helium here, it doesn't really give off helium, but it gives off a particle with two protons and two neutrons. Atomic mass is four because of two neutrons and two protons. So it's a helium nucleus called an alpha particle. Why is it alpha? Because Ernest Rutherford discovered the alpha particles first. He's discovered beta radiation second. So it can be written as this, and written as this form, as the alpha symbol. Notice 90 plus 2. Notice uranium 92 becomes thorium 90. Why did it transmutate? Because it lost two protons. And atomic number 92 becomes 90, becomes a brand new element. So the element changes as you lose protons. Why are you losing protons? Because it's overcrowded. Look at radon, 86. Hey, that is radioactive because it's beyond atomic number 83. It gives off two protons and two neutrons. What does it become? It doesn't become why. Well, 4 plus 222 is 218. I'm sorry, 222 is a total number. So 218 plus 4 equals 222. And then what would be this? proton number or this atomic number what number plus two is 86 well 84 so what elements atomic number 84 well go to the pair table polonium and that's what madame curie actually discovered okay but polonium although it's still radioactive because it's what atomic number 84 it is more stable than radon because it has less protons right okay so it's getting stabler but it'll, it'll re react itself and here's an example big atom a lot of protons 83, beyond atomic number 83, every element of every isotope or every isotope of every element is going to be unstable. Too many protons. So this is going to lose what? 
This four here means that protons and neutrons have the same mass. So atomic number four, two what? Two neutrons, two protons, it's a helium nucleus is emitted. Why are the neutrons emitted with protons? Because we know that neutrons somehow stabilize the protons. So we can't just emit two protons. Two neutrons have to go. So the thorium becomes four atomic mass units lighter, and it becomes two atomic mass units smaller as it transmutates. And there is the what? The nuclear, not chemical, nuclear equation. 90 plus 2 is 92. 234 plus 4 is 238. Alpha decay. It's an alpha symbol. Okay? And then, of course, the fourth way, too much stored energy in the nucleus. Now, this could occur, uh, and this usually releases gamma radiation. Gamma radiation is just electromagnetic radiation. It has a symbol. It doesn't change the mass or the atomic number. You just go from a higher energy to a lower energy. And of course, why would this occur? This could be because it, it was bombarded. Uh, just again, some other uh, form of um, energy that these atoms have beyond the scope of this course. But the bottom line is they get more stable by emitting a high energy electromagnetic wave. And remember, gamma radiation okay, have incredible, even smaller wavelengths. Remember, energy equals the frequency. Frequency gets incredibly high with smaller wavelengths. So the gamma radiation, okay, incredible high energy, and you do not want to be around that with great amount, okay? So in any case, moving forward, okay, let's go under uh, the type of nuclear emissions. We have alpha, beta, positron, and gamma, and they have symbols. And alpha, has a plus two, a mass of plus four. It has a very low penetrating power. This is a very, very heavy particle. Two protons, two neutrons. Um, and it does have a relatively ionizing power because it's able to, um, because it's a plus two uh, proton, it can pull electrons from things. So it definitely can make surrounding area, okay, uh, ionize into positive and negative. This can grab electrons from things, so therefore other things become positive. That's what ionizing power is. Beta, that's that electron coming from the nucleus. Charge of negative one. Now, it's much lighter. Remember, it's just an electron. Electrons are 2,000 times lighter than, than that of a proton or neutron. All right, so this is about 8,000 times lighter than an alpha particle. So therefore, because it's so light, it's got a greater penetrating power, and that's what makes beta radiation very dangerous. Beta radiation can get into your cells, and it can mutate your DNA. Okay, positron about the same. And then gamma, because it's not made of any mass, has even greater penetrating power. This is why we build nuclear reactors with reinforced lead and concrete to keep the gamma radiation from leaking out into the environment. Okay, and of course, this is an incredible mutagen as well. So you want to be, you do not want to be around beta, positron, or, or gamma. Alpha decay, we're actually around all the time. Our smoke detectors actually work by shooting um, uh, alpha particles out in between a gap, which is essentially electro, um, you know, two plates to, that are basically need to be closed in order to close the circuit and make a sound. So alpha particles are emitted and electrons are pulled from smoke or carbon particles, not nitrogen and oxygen, they're two electronegative. So they pull electrons. So these helium nuclei plus two with two neutrons can pull electrons from the smoke in between the two um, uh, electrodes and cause the air to be ionized. And of course, the positives would go to one and the negatives would flow to the other anode and cathode and close the circuit. And so we're around alpha particles all the time. They are not dangerous. OK, and they don't penetrate our skin. All right. But these three, uh, these other three, you do not want to be around. And the, the, the problem is, is that many um, elements, as we're going to see, don't just give off alpha, beta, or positive. Sometimes they give off all three in different ways. So and I'll explain that. All right. So any case, um, we should understand that the more dangerous, the heavier you are. And this is table O in your pyrrhic table. The heavier, OK, the less penetrating. The beta particle and the positron all have second most and gamma is the deepest okay and so you can see these particles are given to you as the symbols here so alpha particles a helium nucleus and by the way helium is made on this earth by alpha radiation some unstable nucleus nuclei of a metal atom in the earth loses two protons and two neutrons that thing gains two electrons on its way to the surface and becomes helium so helium is actually made on our planet by alpha decay of metals that have too many protons in our Earth. It's kind of cool. Okay. Now, notice something here. 
The heavier the particle, the less the penetration. The lighter the particle, the more penetration. Even though we put a zero here, beta particles and positrons do have some mass. And look at here, gamma radiation has no mass and no charge, so that's the deepest penetration. Notice the neutron is written with a mass number of one, so is a proton. Notice it has no charge. Protons have a mass of one. Positrons also have a positive charge. So table O is a good friend in looking at, okay, these particles, these types of emissions, okay? Top number is mass, bottom number is charge, okay? And then table N, na 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 na, hey, 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 the last table, table N. And so it lists selective because there's more. Look at carbon-14, okay? It's, it's what, a B negative. What's a B negative? Beta. What does beta occur? Too many neutrons, right? So if you look at here, okay, the most abundant isotope is the average. Okay, so look at gold, AU. Its average isotopic mass when you weigh in all the isotope is about 197. Hey, this has one more pro a neutron, right, than 197. That's why it's beta decay. Let's look at some more. Cobalt is actually 50, rounds off to 59. Cobalt 59 is the most abundant. So it normally has 59, right? The weighted mass is always closest to the most abundant. Always one has the highest percentage. But look at this. So 59 is what this average is to. This is cobalt 60. It's got one more neutron. Oh, B negative. We're going to get rid of that. What's going to happen is a what? A neutron splits into a proton and a positron. Okay. Look at cesium 133. It rounds off to, which cesium 133 is the most stable isotope. And again, 137 is above that. Too many neutrons. And it goes beta decay. Okay, let's look at potassium. Normally, it's 39. Whoa, calcium 37. It's under the most stable form, which means it has positron decay. But the proton is becoming a neutron and emitting the positron. So there's the reasoning right there. Notice H3 has too many what? Neutrons. And it goes beta decay. All right, so good job there. Oh, and of course, I should have mentioned francium okay francium's atomic number 87 i know you don't see that here you have to look it up and 87 is bigger than 83 so it's got too many what too many protons gives off that alpha decay all right i'm not gonna play this but this is a great little video that shows you can actually see how far these guys move okay um something you should know is that when i shoot uranium uranium can actually have three forms so some forms of uranium can give off alpha particles. So this is a uranium with multiple isotopes. Some isotopes can give off alpha particles. Notice they'll move toward the negative plate. If they give off gamma rays, they're not going to be affected by the negative and positive plate because gamma rays have no charge. They have no mass either. That's why they're the most penetrating. And beta particles will deflect toward the positive because they have a negative charge. So the alpha particles would go slower and they would deflect more toward the negative. Beta particles would go faster, penetrate more, but they would deflect toward the positive because they're negative. Gamma rays would be the most penetrating because they have no mass, but they wouldn't be affected, no charge. Pretty simple stuff there. And I'm not going to show you that animation because I think you can play that on your own. Okay, decay series. This is important. If I've got plutonium-239, hey, there's too many what? Protons. Plutonium, okay? Um, if we look at our periodic table, all right, is atomic number 94, way over atomic number 83. So it undergoes alpha decay. And what's it become? Well, it becomes uranium 92. 94 becomes 92. Uranium 235. Oh, well, that's got too many what? Protons. It undergoes alpha decay. And what's it become? Thorium, because thorium is atomic number what? 90. But thorium 231 has too many neutrons. I'm sorry, uh, thorium 231 has too many neutrons to what? Protons it undergoes beta decay. And you can see how this works. And eventually these guys all get smaller until they get to what? Oh, down there is lead. All right, so the last one on here is lead. And so when we find lead, by the way, atomic number 82, anytime we find lead in the ground, we stop all digging and we know something. We know what? We know that we have probably have other things decaying into it. Okay, it's called a radioactive series. Good for me, good for you. All right, and lead, of course, is, okay, doesn't have that atomic number 83. All right, and here's another example of that decay series, okay, of things working in ways back to lead, okay? All right, so here are some questions. You can do these on your own and open these up. 
So I want you to practice all these questions. I did omit some, and this kind of goes over everything. And, and then we're going to work on the form. So I know it's a little long today, but a lot to go over. So try these questions on this slide. They give the answers when you click. Which element has no known stable isotope? Okay. We're talking about, we're talking about elements that are beyond atomic number 83. Okay. And that shows you that you can click through that. So click through these questions. And then when you're done, okay, if you have problems writing something called a nuclear equation, I have a little video that's linked here to help you do that. Hope this helped.